If you have your black ESV Bibles, turn with me to page 944. We're going to read Romans 8, verses 1 to 8. Stay with me as you get that. We'll read it together. Romans 8, verses 1 to 8. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. For him for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you've given us your word, and we need its do it so as we apply and interpret it. And we would apply and interpret your word as it is meant to, to be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. May we see you. The recidivism rate among prisoners is the rate by which don't scratch your head when you got a thing in your ear. <laughs> uh, the recidivism rate in, uh, in prisoners are, is the rate at which prisoners who are incarcerated are set free but then sent back to jail or sent back to prison to serve more time. They say the, 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 one of the main reasons for the recidivism rate among incarcerated uh, criminals is that because they don't know how to live on the outside world once they get there. Uh, especially for those who have spent long-term sentences within the prison system, by the time they get out, no matter how much education there is within the prison, when they get out, all of a sudden they're confronted by freedoms that they've never been confronted with. They're, they've been confronted with responsibilities that they've never been confronted with. So oftentimes they find themselves outside of the prison walls, almost scared, in a sense, not knowing how to live or what to do on a regular basis. How do you maintain a job? How do you get a job? How do you maintain relationships? How do you gain relationships? And so all of these things are just, uh, cause a lot of uh, anxiety towards a lot of prisoners. And ultimately, many of them end up going back to prison almost intentionally because that's where they feel safe. That's where they feel secure uh, because they don't know what to do, how to live with them. I find oftentimes in the life of Christians, we call it the backslidden state. And oftentimes, when a person comes to Christ, they're saved, they don't know how to live the Christian life. We talk about freedom, we talk about being free, we sing about being free, we talk about parallel of, of being uh, in prison, uh, locked up, shackled to the law, and then being set free by the Spirit, or in the Spirit, by the work of Christ, but yet once we're free, oftentimes as Christians, we don't know how to go about living the Christian life. And unfortunately, you see individuals in falter and backslidden the state. They don't know what to do. But there's a lack of discipleship, lack of maturity, and they ultimately go back sometimes to the, to the uh, activity and life that they were so accustomed to before. Romans 8 turns a huge corner because now all of a sudden, Paul has been talking about the law, has been talking about the sin, and in fact, he hasn't mentioned the Spirit more than twice in the first seven chapters, and now, in the first 11 verses, he's already mentioned the Spirit 10 times. And within the 11th chapter in itself, we see him mentioned the Spirit about 26 times. Now, all of a sudden, Paul has turned his attention to the Christian life. 
He has, he has talked about the law. He has talked about sin. He has talked about the lack of honor and thanksgiving being generated by the human race towards God. And now all of a sudden, he has turned, he has made his case for the gospel quite clearly. He would have had to have been asleep the entire time not to have heard the gospel message repeated over and over and over again throughout Romans chapter 1 to 7. And now he turns to a life in the spirit. The life that the Christian is called to live. In fact, Paul actually starts out this passage back in chapters 5, verses 16 and 17, when he starts talking about the new life in Christ versus the old life in Adam. He just happened to enter into a, a parenthetical section, or a section where he is kind of qualifying everything that he just said, and then almost gets back into that new life in Christ. And so here he is uh, expounding on the life that we are called to live in the Spirit. Now, I'm going to preface everything that I'm about to say with this. You will probably be somewhat disappointed in the end of this sermon. Because I'm not going to get into everything that I'm going to get into next week. So this week is kind of an introduction, in a sense. It's like the preface that nobody reads in the book. Except, you're kind of forced to hear it because I'm here and you're here. What do you know? And so, so we're going to go through this. And we're not actually going to get into everything because there's a lot to be said of what that what he's actually saying here. And so we can't unpack it all this week. So I'm just going to introduce this concept and cause you to think in a certain way and to get you moving in the right direction during the week so that next week you and I come together and look at it again and study what that really looks like and how it looks like. Today, the two things I want to look at is the Christian's creed and the life application that is lived out and dictated by that creed. Now, everybody has a creed. A creed, all it is, uh, officially speaking, uh, according to Miriam Western Dictionary, is a set of, uh, of principles. Uh, of principles that you believe in. That is a creed. Okay? They're guiding, it's a guiding philosophy, if you will. Everybody has a creed. They may not be able to uh, uh, communicate it well. But everybody has a creed. Everybody has a set of principles that they live to. The only time when the, when, when the problem arises is when there's a conflict between the way they live their life according to what they say they believe. And that could go either way. And that could go for the agnostic atheist who says they don't believe in God, but yet lives in such a way where they're held accountable by something, someone, or even the Christian who believes in a God, God the Bible, and Christ, salvation went through Christ, received Christ, and lives in a way. That is not according to their creed. I hope that's not like the beginning of like a lot of Of course, there's small yards in the so Give me a couple minutes. And so that is a creed. And so the Christian's creed really is the gospel message. If you were to unpack or summarize or read a synopsis of the gospel message, that would be the Christian's creed. And in fact, verses 1 to the first half of 4, verse 8, 4 in Romans 8 would be, could be that creed for the Christian. Read it with me again. Verses 1 to the first half of verse 4. There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. We start right there. There are three components to this creed. There are three components that the Christian really must adhere to in order to really call themselves a Christian. This is the like bare bones of theology, getting these three things straight. And in this creed, there we see three components. The first component, the first state that man finds himself in is in a condemned state. That's what Paul says. Uh, the man is in a condemned state. In other words, we have sinned against God and there must be reparation. There must be restitution made. We have incurred God's wrath. We have incurred God's anger. And therefore, we stand condemned by God. Now, that, that shouldn't come as a surprise. It shouldn't be such an odd concept. Because 
We understand that and operate according to that concept every single day of our lives. As, as we sin against somebody, we understand that there must be uh, a reparation made. There must be a restitution there. There must be an amends. There must be some kind of atonement given to right the wrong that's been made when we sin against somebody. Say I sin against uh, Crystal here. I steal Crystal's nifty little watch. And so I take Crystal's watch and I sin against her. Now, the only way to make things right is somebody's got to pay for it. Either I have to pay for a new watch to give it back to her, or she must pay for the new watch. So if she forgives me and says, no, Brad, that's okay, she then incurs that. By her mercy, by her grace, she receives that and she pays for it herself. Or I come with her. Apologize and repent and say, Crystal, here's a new watch that I just bought. I know if I gave it back. There must be an atonement made in order to right the wrong. And so what happens when you sin against God? What happens when you sin against the Creator, the infinite, divine uh, Creator of God who created you and I have a loving relationship with Him? What happens when we sin against God? Who's going to make the reparation again? Who's going to make an atonement? Who's going to make the restitution? How are we going to right this wrong that's been cosmically made? So Paul answers that question in this creedal statement saying, God did through Christ what the human flesh was too weak to do. In other words, we found ourselves in a helpless state. Okay, so we were in a condemned state, and now we found ourselves in a helpless state, and that is, we can't do anything about it. How are you going to right a wrong when it comes to God? When it comes to sin against God, there must be that wrong must be right. And what Paul is saying is, on our own, we can't do that. We are limited, finite individuals, unable to make things right on a divine and cosmic level as we have sinned against God. So we are in a helpless state, aren't we? There's nothing we can do on our own to make things right. That's where we see. Well, that's where we see free state. Now that, that helpless state shouldn't shock you either. Because even then we see that. Let's say you take a child. A child is throwing a ball in the house. And the mother says it's Mother's Day because says, stop throwing the ball in the house. Then he continues to throw the ball in the house. And all of a sudden, you know, he breaks a priceless vase that's been sitting there. And now, the vase has been shattered. It's been shattered in a hundred different pieces. So the child has a complete inability to put it back together. The child has no money. He can't pay for another. So in all of his verses, that child is completely helpless in his ability to right this wrong. So the parent has to absorb that. The child has incurred the wrath of his mother. Okay? And as a result, she must uh, absorb that wrong that has been made. But yet, the gospel message, as it is our creed, doesn't stop there. And that is, we have been placed in a freed state. John 5, 24 says, Truly, truly, say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He is not condemned in his past from life, but death so there's that state, that, that, that freed state that the individual finds himself, the sinner finds himself once they have received Christ as Savior. And here it is, a, uh, an activity that it can only happen through a triune God. In these four verses, we see the Trinity at play, which I think is quite fascinating. There's only several passages in the Scripture that we see the interplay of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit at work at the same time. That it is, both the, it is Christ that has paid the price. This is God the Father who has sent the Son. And it's the Holy Spirit that has, 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 has secured and actually procured the individual's salvation. If you were really to say, I'm going to unpack this a little bit next week. But if you were to really understand this, the Trinitarian involvement of a person's salvation would be God the Father calling the individual to salvation. Sending his Son to die on the cross. The Son dying on the cross, paying for yours and my sin, for yours and my sin. 
and the Holy Spirit procuring the believer and ushering him into, from death into life, from incarceration to freedom. It's a wonderful picture. So if you're looking, to illustrate that, basically you and I being incarcerated, and then all of a sudden, a Father has called us to salvation and we respond to that salvation. An individual dies for us, and yet another individual comes and ushers us out. That's exactly what happened to salvation. God called us, we responded. Christ paid the price for our salvation. His Holy Spirit came in, took us, and brought us out of salvation. Perfect Trinitarian understanding. That's bare bones when it comes to the Christians understanding. That's the theology. Somebody can't really call themselves a Christian that can't get that far. That can't get as far as their own condemnation, their helpless state before God, and their freed state in Christ. And so now, if that's the creed, just like any creed or any life philosophy or principle, uh, believing principle, there's a life application and there's a way to live following it. We see that with every philosophy. Show me how you live, and I will, show me long enough how you live, and I can point to you what your creed statement is in life, what you truly believe. And that's the case, should be the case with everyone. So you take somebody who is a, uh, a virtue ethicist, basically for the virtue ethicist, they believe that inerrant in every single person is the ability to, 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 to know thyself well enough that if we just uh, uh, gain as, as much knowledge as we possibly can about ourselves, then we will do the right thing. And so their life application, the virtue, uh, the, uh, the virtue ethicist, their life application would be one of constantly trying to know thyself. To know us, to, to, to get in, and, and once we come to a certain knowledge and understanding and wisdom of ourselves, then we will really know how to act and live. Same thing goes with the hedonist. An individual that believes that there's really nothing on earth that is, is worth doing, so we might as well uh, do the best we can to gain happiness and to, to maximize happiness and minimize pain, and so throughout their life, that hedonist will do everything they can to maximize the happiness in their life. Everything they do, they will strive for a certain degree of happiness and minimize it, as much pain as they can in their life. Right? So every single creed, every single belief statement has a life application. And so too does the Christians. The creedal statement have a life application. And that's exactly what we see in chapter 8. If you turn back, second half of verse 4, he writes this. We walk not according to the Christian, we walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh, their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. The question is, what does that look like? It's one thing to say we're free, it's another thing to all of a sudden enter into a life where we're walking with the Spirit. If we were to go back to the metaphor, the illustration of incarceration, here we see it. Imagine, imagine that the, the incarcerated individual is, is let out of prison, but yet somebody is there waiting for them. And they say, listen, I know you've been incarcerated this whole time. You've never lived in freedom in your life. And so I'm going to follow you. I'm going to eat with you. I'm going to go where you go. I'm going to do what you do. And I'm going to show you exactly how to live an outstanding uh, life as a citizen. I'm going to teach you how to get a job. I'm going to teach you how to maintain a job. I'm going to teach you how to, how to speak to people. I'm going to follow you everywhere you go. And that's the promise we have with the Holy Spirit. Meeting us at the point of salvation and walking with us the entire time. And so the life application for the Christian and the Christian creed is that we would walk in the Spirit. Now, if you are a thinking individual, and I hope you are, 
and you don't just take passages and glance over them or take these, these statements that you must walk in the Spirit saying that we really have no idea what that looks like. If that's not true, then you are asking the question and you should ask the question or you should ask the question at some point in time, what does that look like? What does it look like to walk in the Spirit? It's an important question. What does it actually look like? If, if I'm called to walk in the Spirit, what does that look like? Practically played out. It's an odd concept. It's an odd concept. If I were to tell you, go ahead and walk out in the rain, you'd understand what that means. You'd understand, okay, Brad wants us to walk out the door, just walk in the rain. If I were to say it in a more abstract concept, I want you to walk in love. Using the concept a little bit more abstract, but you would still understand that, oh, we should love everybody. We should love our neighbors. We should love our brother, sister, Christ. We should love our family. We should love this person and that person. But to say to walk in the Spirit, that's a, a, a different concept, it's an odd concept, but yet so fundamental to yours and my creedal state in Christ. So Paul answers that question in verse 5. But he doesn't answer it in a way that he comes right out and says, this is how, this is what it looks like to walk in the Spirit. First, he contrasts it. He contrasts it first with walking in the flesh. You see, Sometimes it's easier to explain something if you contrast it with another thing. So if you've never actually walked in the rain before, and I said, well, if you've walked in the sun, then it's, it's like the opposite of walking in the sun. So if you walked in the sun, you might have said, okay, well, it's dry, it's hot, it's bright. Okay, walking in the rain would be the exact opposite of that. So it's wet, it's cold, and it's dark. So you would understand, you have a better understanding of it. So, well, that's what Paul said. Because he understands that his audience is an audience that has walked in the flesh probably the majority of their lives. And so they know what it is to walk in the flesh. They just don't know what it is to walk in the spirit. So he says, you've walked in the spirit up until now. But now we walk in the flesh. So you know what it's like to walk in the flesh. And if you remember, walking in the, the, the flesh is used synonymously with the natural desires of man. So if you walk according to the, spirit, the flesh... That is, that you would follow the, the natural desires of man as though God does not exist. That you would do whatever it is that you want to do in, with such an understanding that God doesn't exist, or that you would do it the same way as though God did not exist and have a standard of living for you. So walk in the flesh, walk according to the natural desires. Now, to do so, to walk in the, according to the flesh, is the same way as setting, what Paul says is setting your mind on the flesh. He says, up until now, you set your mind on the things of the flesh. When you set your mind on things of something, you are, you are uh, calibrating the tra trajectory to a certain destination. When you set your mind on something, you are calibrating your tra tra trajectory according to the uh, final destination. Some of you might have a little GPS in your phone. You have a little GPS in your phone. What happens? I'm going to so and so's I'm going to Bob's house. I don't know where Bob lives, so I set Bob's address in my GPS. I am calibrating my trajectory to end up at that final destination. Now what happens when I set my trajectory according to that? When I'm setting my mind on that, that's where I will go. And either I will, either one or two things will happen. Either you go. Or you have that constantly annoying voice in the GPS saying, you've turned the wrong way, recalculate, recalculate. you turn turned the wrong way, recalculate, over and over and over again. So there lies the conflict that we've been talking about the last several weeks. Where, so when we set our mind on something, that's what happens. We end up going there. We end up doing that. And so Paul says that's dangerous. There are, there are ramifications to that. He says that there are results to following the flesh, to setting your trajectory according to the flesh, to setting your mind on the flesh. He says, this is where it ends up. So he's reminding the Romans, you know, Paul, I don't know about all this walking in the spirit. I've been walking the flesh so long. He says, well, this is what happens for those who walk in the flesh. Verse 6, he says, for to set the mind on the flesh is death. Verse 7, he says, to set the mind on the flesh uh, is hostile to God. And in verse eight, those who set the, uh, in verse seven rather, those who set their mind on the flesh, they do not submit to God's law. Notice one thing. 
Notice one thing about those three ramifications, those results. It has nothing to do with them or the life that they live. It has everything to do with how it is received by God. Paul's not standing there saying, if you set your, your, your sights on the flesh, everything's just going to go bad in life. And you keep doing that, your wife's going to leave you, you lose your job, you're going to lose all your finances, everything's just going to go horrible, going to happen. He doesn't say that, does he? Because he knows that the person of marriage could stay intact, he'd keep his job, and he would gain all the wealth until the day he dies. He doesn't say that. He says, he, he says what's important, the eternal effect, that is before God, it is death. He doesn't say it leads to death. I'm sure he could have said that setting your mind on the flesh will lead to death, but he doesn't say that. He says it is death. I believe that is death before God. It's an end. It's, it's, it's a dead end. It leads to nothing. It leads to nowhere. And then from there he says that it, it, uh, it's death, and it's also hostile to God. What happens when you're hostile to God or hostile to anybody? All of a sudden, you, you hate what God loves and you love what God hates. You're constantly in enmity with God. There's a constant battle there with God. If you continue to set your, your, your mind on the flesh, there's going to be that constant hostility between you and God. And finally, you're not going to submit to God. Why would you submit to God? Why would you end up, if you set your GPS on something, why would you end up anywhere but that place? If I set myself by my GPS on Bob's house, I'm not going to end up at the Exxon station. Why? Because assuming the GPS does what it's supposed to do, I end up at Bob's house. So this is a, if you're going to set your mind on the flesh, there's no way your final destination is going to get you to where God wants you to be because it's not set there in the first place. It's going to be here 100% of the time. The deeds of the flesh will play out rather than the fruit of the Spirit. What he's describing is the prodigal son. I made reference to that a few different times in these last several chapters. But he's describing the prodigal son. The son that set his mind on the deeds of the flesh. He was against his father. His desire, his will was, it was hostile to his father's. He refused to submit to his father's uh, rules. See, he had been raised in a home where his father loved him. He cherished him. He had everything that he ever needed. He was, he was, he was born into the house. God, his father had a plan for him. And he was going to work that plan. His father was going to continue to nurture this child, this son. But he refused to submit. He was constantly hostile to his father. And in the end, it was as though he had died to his father. Before he ever come back, his father, especially in the Middle Eastern culture, once there's a rebellion and they leave, they become dead to the family. So for all intents and purposes of the father, he was dead. For all intents and purposes of the father, he, he, he was constantly hostile. He constantly would refuse to submit to his father's will. So that's what happens when you set the, the sights and set your trajectory in the deeds of the flesh. Ah, so hopefully now you start saying, okay, understanding what it means to then set your mind on the spirit. Verse 5, it says, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, it says, set your mind on the Spirit himself. Is it the things of the Spirit that we're supposed to set our mind on, or the Spirit himself? It's both. In the Greek, the term things is not even there. We're to set our minds on the things of the Spirit. We're to set our mind on the Spirit himself. What does that mean? All of a sudden, we start to draw our attention to the Spirit. All of a sudden, we start to draw our attention to the things of the Spirit. All of a sudden, we set our trajectory to something other than the deeds of the flesh, and that being the will of God, that being the Spirit. I still have to answer the question of what it exactly looks like to walk in the Spirit. And I'm not even going to answer that yet. I'm going to try to qualify a little bit more before we do that. See, according to John, turn with me to John 16, 7. Some of you know the passage. John 16, 7. Jesus has just told his disciples that he's not going to be around for long. And of course, you can understand and hear the big groan coming from him. Don't leave. Don't go. Please, Jesus, stay. Don't leave. This is what he says to them. Starting in verse, uh, uh, right where the passage starts, second half, verse 4. He says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. 
But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you asked, where are you going? Because I said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. Had Jesus not left them, the Holy Spirit would not have come. So the Holy Spirit was to replace the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Catch me. Get this. Was to replace the physical presence of Jesus in the life of his disciples. Okay? The Holy Spirit was to come to replace the physical presence of Jesus by indwelling his disciples. Okay? So if Jesus had not gone, there would have been no need for the Holy Spirit. But now that Jesus was parting, there would be a need for that constant presence. And so when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus. It's used synonymously. Now, when Jesus said, follow me to his disciples, he didn't just say, follow me, I want you to walk behind me and just stay back there. It's not what it meant to follow Jesus, is it? That where Jesus walked, you stayed three feet behind, you never uh, walked with him, never talked to him, you just follow him around. It's not what Jesus meant when he said, follow me, is it? We know that. We know what he was calling his disciples to do was to interact with his ministry to them. When Jesus says, follow me, he is calling his disciples to interact with his ministry to them. To engage his ministry to them. And so, in that way, it starts out with saving them. When he says, follow me, it started by, by, by his ministry to them was to save them. It was to then continue to guide them. It was to, to love them. It was to fellowship with them. It was to serve them. It was to do all of these things. And so when he said, follow me, he was calling them to engage with his ministry to them. Not just to follow behind him in his presence, but to engage him with his ministry to them. Now, if that was Jesus' call to his disciples, it remains the same call to, uh, to his disciples today. That we do not have the physical presence of Jesus, but yet we have the spiritual and dwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And so to walk in the Spirit is to engage with the ministry that the Spirit has to us. Can somebody close these windows over here? Somebody? Not that I'm an easily distracted person, which I am. Thank you, guys. I'd love for them to hear the sermon. <laughs> now, hopefully you're starting to get the picture that when a person was called to come to Christ, to, to believe in Christ, to walk with Christ, they were called to engage with the ministry of Christ to them. Equally so, as we are called to walk in the Spirit, we are called to engage in the ministry that the Spirit has towards us as He indwells us. Okay. So the question is, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? So what it means to walk in the Spirit is that you and I would engage in Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ that indwells each believer according to his ministry to us. Okay, so somebody comes to Christ, I accept the Christ, great, now walk in the Spirit. So what I'm saying is, identify what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to you and engage that. Now that starts, that, now undergirding all of this is having a good pneumatology, a good theology of the Holy Spirit. Now, a cursory understanding that there are about seven things that we see within Scripture that helps us understand what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to us. We see that He teaches us. We see that He testifies over God's Word to us. We see that He guides us. We see that He convicts us. We see that He regenerates us. We see that He intercedes with us, for us. We see that He commands us. Now, to walk in the Spirit is to engage that ministry. To constantly be taught, be testified to, to be guided, to be uh, convicted, to be regenerated, to receive His intercession on behalf of us, to be commanded by the Spirit. That's big. 
because it has many implications to it. So that's what I'm going to open up next week. And then this week was just kind of an introduction to what I really understand, what I really feel is the, the uh, pivotal point to help us understand the Spirit's ministry to us. Because all too often we, we, we reflect on being set free in Christ, but yet we rarely understand what we're called to do and the calling being to walk in the Spirit. So I would suggest this, take this week to ask yourself the question, what is my trajectory set? What is my traje trajectory? Is that right? Or right? What is my trajectory set to? What is my destination? What is my desired destination? For? If it is anything but walking in the Spirit, then it's the wrong thing. Take this time this week to really engage it and read some passages on the Holy Spirit. And read some passages in Romans 8 here to have a better understanding. So when we get into it next week, we'll have a better understanding of what the Holy Spirit's ministry is to us so that we might know how better to walk with the Spirit. Dear Holy Father, God, I ask, Lord, let us be students of your word. Let us understand, let us be students of your spirit. Let us understand that um, you have indwelt us with your spirit. There is a supernatural, metaphysical component to our relationship with you, and that's not something that we truly and fully understand. So God, I pray that you would help us understand what that ministry of the Holy Spirit looks like in my life and, how, and the life of everybody here and how we are called to walk in the Spirit and what that means. That we might be good stewards of your Spirit as we are called to be good stewards of everything that you can bless us with. We pray in Jesus' name.